Um, but it's 802. So the main event, though, is my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Miley Young Karras. <laughs> I'll give all the names, um, who really needs no introduction, obviously, because she's been doing this for many years. Um, and of course, this isn't even a topic that she's necessarily doing research on or involved in, but Miley will always step up and do anything if asked. No, I'm just kidding. She won't and don't ask her to do everything because she's already um, very overburdened. Um, but she really is so wonderful that she's giving this talk to us today. I think we have a lot to learn about how Cabinuva is gonna roll out. Um, and if Miley wants to share anything else, I will let her, her uh, do that before she goes. And then just one last thing is to use the chat to ask questions. If you wanna send something to me privately, that's fine, but I'll be uh, monitoring things. Miley, I will give you a 15 minutes um, warning, just so, so you're aware and uh, we can go from there. And with that, Dr. Miley Harris young You can start sharing. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you so much, Dr. Blumenthal. Yeah, let me start sharing here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about entering a new era of HIV care, long-acting injectables, and more for HIV. Um, I've already been introduced. I'm an associate professor of medicine here in both the divisions of infectious diseases and global public health, as well as geriatrics oops, and gerontology. Um, I'm also uh, one of the co-directors of our San Diego Center for AIDS Research Clinical Investigations Corps. And if you're interested in doing um, HIV research or uh, research in populations that are at risk for HIV and you're struggling to try to figure out how to get started, give us an email or a ring. Um, we love talking to people about projects and helping them put things together. That is part of my job. So, so please feel free to, to reach out to me and Dr. Laura Bamford. Okay. So... I just briefly, oh, this is, sorry, I think I'm on slides. Might be out of the day. <laughs> yeah, sorry, my, my pictures are going to be a little bit uh, out of cycle, but I really briefly wanted to talk about the evolution of HIV care. Um, I was not around in the medical field when uh, a lot of this type of HIV care was being done. I know many of you here present were, um, but I did kind of have a bit of a, a side view of HIV care. I had an uncle um, that passed uh, in, in the uh, 90s from AIDS. Um, and this is the start, or this was kind of the start of HIV care. So HIV care, this is the face of AIDS. Um, David Kirby and his family here uh, really humanized the impact of, of HIV and AIDS on people's lives and their families' lives. Um, and this is how HIV care started, as hospice care. Um, but, you know, the just Herculean efforts of the community and scientists and clinicians uh, was able to change that to, sorry, let me go back. <laughs> My sides are off. Um, having a, a handful of medications that saved lives. So it was no longer a death sentence. But people still had to take these handfuls of pills and often pills, other pills, to manage the side effects of pills to, to survive and to live. And today, HIV care is just one pill once a day for many, many people, not all. So this has been an amazing evolution. And yet, despite that um, and all these amazing treatment advances, well, we're, still, we're still not there. <laughs> um, in, in the U.S., despite most people living with HIV being diagnosed, we, we, there's an estimate that about 86% of all people living with HIV are diagnosed. Only about 65% of them actually receive care. Um, half of them are retained in care, meaning they're regularly seeing someone for their HIV, and 56% of them are virally suppressed. Um, in San Diego, we do slightly better. So our, our uh, diagnosis rate is slightly higher, closer to 87%. 74% um, have received care at some point. 52% are retained in care. So that number is, is pretty similar to, to the general US, um, but 62% are achieving viral suppression. So we're still really, really, really far away from these 90, 90, 90 goals that the UNAIDS had challenged us all to achieve. So why? why? Why is it so difficult to get people in care, keep them in care, and keep them virally suppressed? Uh, well, based, you know, like I, I like 
this slide a lot. Um, it, it basically, it, because it is, it's talking to people in the community and asking them, you know, like, what are your reasons? Um, if you look at, at people, the percentage of people that had at least one important barrier reported for either getting into HIV care, starting art, or, or why they discontinued art, the majority of people said there was at least one very important barrier that prevented them from, from adhering to care and adhering to art. Um, and there's lots of different reasons. You know, I think when you look at barriers to HIV care, a lot of these top uh, barriers are structural issues. So they don't have insurance. 50% of them said they didn't have insurance. They forget their appointments. Um, they can't get an appointment. Uh, it's too expensive to see someone for HIV care. Then they can't afford it. They don't have transportation. So a lot of systemic issues, I think, that are often difficult for us to manage day to day when we're seeing our patients. Um, it's a little different when you look at reasons for never starting art and reasons for discontinuing art. So, so some of the issues that we may be able to affect um, on a person-to-person -person basis. So side effect concerns was, was the main problem or the main concern for people who never started art. Um, interestingly enough, uh, there's clearly a lot more education that we can do because a lot of people thought that they could just control it with a healthy attitude. Um, lots and lots of education that we can do there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are a few things I think uh, that maybe these new long-acting medica medications are going to help us address. So adherence concerns is one. Um, people might find out about HIV and then again adherence concerns. So can't be adherent to my medicine so I stopped it so I wouldn't develop resistance. Um, I think adherence concerns with long-acting that makes sense. Some of you might wonder why I also highlighted people might find out about HIV, and I'll just tell you a brief story about one of my patients. So I have a, a wonderful woman who's incredibly healthy, living with HIV, great T cells, suppressed for years, um, who started dating someone new and you know, had not yet disclosed her HIV status to that person because it was a new relationship, and she was trying to figure out, you know, like, is this a safe person to talk to about this? She, he went through her purse when she was not there, found her pills, Googled them to figure out what they're for, and found out through Google that she was living with HIV, and then attacked her with a knife and nearly cut off her fingers. So, you know, like this, this concern about you know, having to carry pills around or, you know, taking a pill in front of someone it is, is potentially something that long-acting injectables may be able to affect because they won't necessarily have to have pills long lying around or a pillbox full of medicines or carrying things around in their purses. Um, so possibly this is another area that we could affect or that long acting injectables could impact. So <clears throat> um, if we look at reasons why HIV medications are missed, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. I've been talking a lot the last couple of weeks, so <laughs> my voice is a little hoarse. <clears throat> um, the long-acting HIV medications have the potential to really mitigate many of these issues down here, um, as, as we're seeing. So, so certainly, you know, I think taking a long-acting could help if you have to travel a lot, um, if you have privacy concerns, as we just discussed, if you're really busy and you don't remember to take your pills or you can't figure out how to fit into your day, um, uh, if you have problems swallowing pills, which is real for, for some people. They, they really just kind of struggle with the idea of, of, of swallowing pills. Um, if you get bored taking medications every day, uh, if you have to eat food with your medicines, if you run out of medications, you have to work, all of those things potentially could be mitigated by using long-acting injectables. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna stop throughout my talk briefly and see if anybody has any comments just because I think you guys probably know that I enjoy having conversations rather than just talking at people. Um, so if, if there's any comments, Jill, and that kind of pop up in the meantime, let me know. Um, and then also feel free to just interrupt me if you want. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> so um, how could the long acting injectables overcome some of these barriers. So, you know, it decreases the need to take, to remember to take your medications daily. I have to confess, I take a prescribed medication twice a day and I probably miss like 80% of the time I miss a second dose. You know, thankfully it's not for something that needs to be controlled and suppressed and it doesn't develop resistance. But um, uh, I mean, this is difficult for me. 
Um, so, you know, yes, I, I have a crazy work schedule. I think most of us do. That certainly contributes to it as well as crazy mom schedule. Um, but, but a lot of people do. You know, a lot of our folks work one or two jobs. Many of them ha are gig, gig economists. So, you know, they're working at all hours and odd hours of the day, um, maybe in their car and not home for good chunks of time. Um, polypharmacy can also be difficult. I mean, when, when was the last time that your patient that was taking more than 10 medications could identify every single one of their pills based on what they look like? Um, that's tough. And so, you know, if they didn't get something filled, potentially they may miss it because they don't know that that was the HIV pill. Um, if you have to frequently travel for work, uh, like a someone who uh, works for airlines and things like that, that can also be difficult. And then competing interests, kids work, housing, food, relationships, others, all of these things are often more important. And just being able to come in and have a long acting injectable once a month or, or every other month um, may help to really mitigate a lot of these reasons for non-adherence. Um, it also just is still anxiety. We kind of briefly talked about that before, preserves anonymity. Um, and so one of the other things, you know, I haven't seen a lot of discussion about this issue. Um, I've noticed this in, in several of my young, healthier folks that are living with HIV. Um, one of the things that they've told me is they don't like coming to the clinic because it reminds them that they're sick. You know, they're like, I started my meds right away when I was diagnosed. I've never been sick from this. You know, like I live a normal life just like everybody else. He's like, yeah, they're like, yeah, sex is sometimes a little bit more complicated because of the disclosure, but in general, I'm healthy. And when I come to clinic, I'm reminded that I'm living with something for the rest of my life. And, and that's frustrating and depressing to them. Um, I think similarly, see, seeing their pills and taking their pills every day can also help make them feel that way. So I, I think of all the people that are my patients that are most interested in transitioning to long acting, it's not because of these like competing interest concerns. A lot of it has to do with, I just don't want to take a pill every day because I don't want to be reminded of this or it's a hassle. Um, and, and then, you know, it may also increase the proportion of people living with HIV that have 100% adherence. Um, I'd like to see a show of Zoom hands for the HIV providers. How many of you um, really believe that 80% of, of your, you know, virologically suppressed patients have 100% adherence? I'm not, I actually can't see everything. Joe, can you see everybody? <laughs> Let me see if I can. I can't really tell if anybody is, is raising their yes, hand. Yes, <laughs> we've got we've got a no from Darcy. Let me see. I'm <laughs> in the gallery. Oh wait. Let me see what I can see here. I've got just a couple of people in the chat saying no. Daniel. Okay. Stanley's crying because he's laughing. <laughs> um, no, okay. lots, no we're, we've got a lot of no's coming down. So. Yeah, so, so then, you know, uh, um, some of you may be like, well, what doesn't really matter? You know, does 95 or 97% adherence really matter if, you know, our folks remain virologically suppressed and they're not develop developing any resistance? So I would argue that maybe it does. Um, uh, Jose Castillo Mencia, you know, has kind of really piloted a lot of this work where he, he has done these mesoscale inflammatory panels on um, people who are 100% adherent, like 95 to 99, and then like 80 to 95 and less, and demonstrated clinically significant differences in inflammation. So people that are 100% adherent versus the suboptimal, which he, which he considers, you know, like this 90 to 100% range or 90 to 99% range, um, have, uh, have lower IL-6 and D diamond levels. So if you're 100% adherent, you have less inflammation. And he, his studies, unfortunately, you know, are cross-sectional, so we cannot evaluate whether or not this translates into increased morbidity or increased development of some of these HIV-associated comorbidities that we see in our population. Um, but, you know, work from Jason Baker that does correlate, you know, high, higher levels of IL-6 and D-dimer with the risk of cardiovascular disease and whatnot does suggest that this, this might matter for, for some of our folks. Um, the positive perspective study is another study that I thought was really interesting. This was a global study. So this is not just people uh, in the U.S. And uh, if you look here, they asked them, you know, what is the, the, the maximum art dose that you miss per month? And one time per month, two to four times or greater than five times. Um, and based on what they report, there is 
differences in the adjusted odds ratio in suboptimal overall health, um, suboptimal physical health, sexual health, mental health, and then this poor self-prognosis for the HIV mortality. So even if you just miss your meds one time a month, you perceive that you are less healthy, both in the physical, sexual, and mental realm, and you view your, your, view your prognosis with HIV as worse than people who say that they never miss a pill. Um, that did not translate necessarily to, you know, like non-suppression in this population. So there are impacts in, in not being 100% adherent. Miley, um, and, just, Miley yeah. very quickly, Shannon has a very astute comment also uh, that I'll just interrupt for. The survey you showed had a high rate of people stopping due to medication affordability. It highlights the importance of our peer navigators and multidisciplinary support to help navigate insurance enrollment changes because it can be very overwhelming for folks to navigate. And how often have we heard that story? So, yeah, let me let me go. So I love I love love this slide. Um, well, so so yeah, so certainly you know um, there is this, and then I love this slide because it really does show the differences between countries. Medication costs here, like, you know, pretty big circle here up in the in North America, teeny, teeny, teeny circle here in South Africa. I mean, certainly there are reasons for that. And this is appropriate that, you know, people in South Africa are not being charged an arm and a leg for their medication. Um, but it, it's it's interesting to see how there's so many differences. I mean, I think one, one um, barrier that seems to be uh, impactful pretty much across the board, except maybe in Europe, is, is being depressed or overwhelmed. You know, like, so mental health is important. We need to do much more work on this. Just, sorry, side note. <laughs> okay, so um, I know that we're, I know that most of you are here today to really listen and, and talk about the, the new long acting injectables. Um, I'm gonna call them, I'm really gonna try to not call, uh, call these medications by their brand name um, for, you know, like commercial purposes, but, um, uh, I just want to remind you that we've actually had a long-acting injectable around for a while <laughs> now. So ibilizumab, which was approved by the FDA in 2018, um, is an anti-CD4 monoclonal antibody, blocks HIV entry into CD4 T cells. Um, and it's given as an IV infusion, first with a two gram loading dose, followed by 800 milligrams every two weeks after that. Uh, it's FDA approved for use with other optimized background antiretroviral therapy and is highly recommended that you have at least one other fully active agent um, when you're using ibilizumab. And it's only approved for use in highly or heavily treatment experienced adults with multi-drug resistant HIV infection. So we have it. I think we rarely use it. Um, I have, I used to have two people on it. I think I now just have one. Do, do people have experience with ibilizumab? I mean, how many people have, have used this in their population? I actually just asked Lucas directly, but maybe I put him on oh. the spot to ask how many people at Owen were on ibilizumab. Uh, two now, history of four. It's obviously quite a small number for just obviously yeah. our clinic. And obviously if people at other clinics would like to chime in and say if they've used it, but obviously that's a, a very small number. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we have one. we have one right now in the hospital um, who's from Eisenhower, but pretty rare to actually see people come in with this medication. Okay, so um, let's get down to the meat because I know that this is really what you guys want to hear about. So we're, I'm going to briefly summarize some of the key studies of cabotegravir and ropivirine long acting. Um, these slides are different because I'm borrowing them from the national HIV curriculum. So I, I didn't change the color or the appearance of the slides that I borrowed just so you guys knew which ones I have borrowed and which ones I created on my own. So there have been multiple studies uh, now in cap with cabotegravir and long-acting ropivirine. I'm gonna briefly just talk about the phase two trials because I think they're interesting uh, for those uh, folks that are not really used to understanding the process of drug development. They kind of provide a little bit of a glimpse and hopefully will uh, uh, be able to uh, help people understand some of the other me long acting medications that are going to be coming and, and where they're at in, in the stages. Um, and then I'll talk about the phase three trial in treatment naive, the FLARE study, as well as the phase three trials in treatment experienced persons. So, um, so 
latte uh, was a phase to be ran in my study. Um, it included adults with HIV who were antiretroviral therapy naive, had HIV viral loads at least 1,000 copies per mil, and CD4 T cells greater than 200 copies per mil. Um, they excluded people with hepatitis B because neither cabotegravir or ropivirine have activity against hepatitis B, so that's just something to kind of put in the back of your mind, um, just recall that. Um, participants underwent a 24-week oral induction period of uh, cabotegravir and two NRTIs, and that was followed by three different doses of maintenance therapy of oral cabotegravir and ropivirine. Now, this is, this is an oral study, so this is, is taking pills. This is not long-acting. It was primarily a dosing study, and um, they felt that, uh, so if you look at, if you look at um, this graph, you can see that cabotegravir and ropivirine pretty much outperformed uh, efavirenz at, at all three of the doses, but they opted to pick the 30 milligram dose to use uh, and, and carry forward in future studies. Um, ultimately, you know, these combined efficacy results uh, lended support to move that, that oral cabotegravir 30 milligram once a day for, forward for further assessment. And it supported, you know, the assessment of, of actually looking at long-acting injectables of two drug therapies. So this is LATTE-2, and this is a phase 2B randomized open-label trial that was assessing dual therapy with long-acting injectable agents for maintenance. So again, similar inclusion criteria to LATTE, um, creatinine clearance here had to be greater than 50 mils per min. Exclusions were the existence of major resistance mutations, pregnancy. Um, unfortunately, you know, pregnant women get excluded from everything. Um, significant hepatic impairment, and if someone had an AIDS-defining condition. And these studies also had a lead-in phase uh, of cabotegravir, abacavir, and 3TC for 20 weeks. At the 16-week period, they added ropivirine just so people would be exposed to ropivirine before they got the long-acting to prevent any, you know, like, unknown abnormal allergic effect to ropivirine in the setting of having this medication being around for like a whole year. Um, they then transitioned to maintenance with different dosing. So as you can see here, uh, they, they dosed cabotegravir ropivirine uh, every four weeks at a lower dose than they did the cabotegravir ropivirine every eight weeks. Um, and then this is just the, the oral the whole way through. And they identified in it, or they saw that essentially either one of the injectable regimens after having this oral lead-in uh, were, were just as effective as daily three-drug therapy at maintaining HIV viral suppression at um, week 32, 48, and 72. And actually, there's some studies now that show out to 96 weeks. So, um, you know, overall, uh, the injectable regimens were also fairly tolerated. A small proportion of persons experienced fever in the injectable arms, you can see here, compared to the oral arm, or pyrex, I guess I should call it pyrexia, maybe it wasn't technically a fever. Um, and injection, injection site reactions were really common. So 97% had pain, 95% um, you know, had uh, pain in the, in the Q8 week. So, very, very common in, in, in injectables, as I think we would expect. But, um, but very few of them, as you see here, were severe. So, so lots of reactions, but very, very few were severe reactions. All right, any thoughts about those phase two studies? Any comments or questions? No? Okay. So let's get on to FLARE. Um, so therapy with, with uh, uh, long-acting cabotegravir and ropivirine um, is, has been evaluated in both people who are naive and experienced, and, and FLARE is, is a naive study. So they performed a phase three randomized open-label study um, looking at uh, IM cab and ropivirine after an oral induction for treatment-naive adults and compared it to dolotegravir, abacavir, and 3TC. Um, again, very similar to all the other studies, inclusion criteria was uh, about the same, no chronic hep B. And they also did not want to have any NNRTI resistance because ropivirine is an NNRTI that does sometimes have cross resistance with some of the other uh, primary mutations of the other NNRTIs. So they randomized people one to one. Um, and uh, again, very similar approaches. They gave them this oral daily. Uh, 
um, Dolly talking about back of three TC. If they were uh, had an HIV RNA at week 16 that was less than 50, then they were randomized to one or the other. If they did not achieve that outcome, they were not randomized in the study. So they wanted to make sure that they got close to or suppressed basically before they randomized them. Um, gave them four weeks of uh, ropivirine and oral cabotegravir, again, tolerance reasons, um, and then went on to doing the injectable uh, cabotegravir and ropivirine. Um, I like to show these studies because I think it's important, you know, for, for a couple of reasons. It's good to know who were the participants in these clinical trials for several reasons. One, because does it relate to the population that you care for? And number two, are the drug companies actually equitably recruiting people? Um, and they did okay with this one. So, you know, they, they at least included 20% women across the arms. Um, most of the participants were white. Um, it would have probably been nicer to have a little bit more variety here, but it, it is what it is. Um, and the, the, again, the majority of people had CD4 T cell counts that were greater than 500. So very few people had T cell counts that were less than 200. Um, and they had people both with very high viral loads, although not, not many, um, and other folks with kind of like lowish viral loads. Most people are in this lowish level. Um, ultimately, what we're seeing here is that therapy with long-acting cabotegravir and ropivirine was non-inferior to oral therapy with dolichegravir, bacavir, 3TC in people who are HIV naive. So it seems to work just as good as oral therapy. Um, so there, I think a lot of people are mostly concerned about resistance developing with these long-acting medications, and there were three in this uh, IM cab ropivirine arm. All of those had a baseline uh, resistance-associated mutation, or RAM, and developed more on therapy. It's also important to note that there were three virologic failures in the dolichegravir, bacavir, and 3TC arm, but there was no uh, new RAMs detected in those persons, possibly suggesting that folks in this arm uh, that failed, that the issue was more of an adherence thing than uh, the development of drug resistance. Um, Drug-related adverse events, you know, were, were actually uh, a little bit more common in the uh, cabotegravir and ropivirine arm, and this is this is any adverse event excluding injection site reactions. So, so this higher proportion, 28 versus 10, um, is not attributable to injection site reactions. Okay, so sorry, I'll, let me just summarize this in general. So, in general, for uh, people who are naive to therapy. Long-acting IM cabotegravir and ropivirine seems to be a feasible option, but it is not yet FDA approved for that indication. I don't, Lucas, do you know if they're working towards that, or does anybody know if they're, maybe there's somebody here from Vive. I, I don't know. Are they going to try to go for Naive, too? Anyone know? Um, I, I, don't, I don't believe so. I, I mean, you mean in, initiating therapy in, in those that are <clears throat> not initially started on, on oral ART. Yeah. No, I, I don't think so, unless someone, like you said, maybe someone from Beef can comment, but I wasn't aware of that. Okay. Yeah, I haven't seen anything either, but I don't, I don't know if this is going to move forward or not. Um, okay. Miley, so, this is Shannon. The, okay. I think it's a funny misnomer to say naive too. I mean, it, it is naive patients, but they have to have an oral lead-in that leads to suppression. So then in... Yeah you know, in it's all really honesty, they're then switch patients, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that That's might really be something, yeah. it's something important to point out, especially with folks that are in primary care that may not see as many HIV patients. I'd be worried if there's a naive approval, that that could get misinterpreted as you could put it on truly in a truly naive patient. So, but yeah, great. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. yeah, no, no, that, that, thank you for pointing that out. I was, I was thinking that in my head and didn't say it, but <laughs> But yeah, that was the study design. They got suppressed first with three drugs, and then they got switched. Um, okay, so ATLAS study is uh, was one of the first studies for long-acting intramuscular cabotegravir and ropivirine for maintenance. Um, again, phase three study, similar inclusion criteria. criteria. Um, they had to be, though, so, so this is, I think, what I really want to drill down. So if you, to be eligible for the study, you had to have a stable antiretroviral regimen for more than six months, 
Um, your HIV RNA had to be less than 50 copies per mil for more than six months. You had to have no history of virologic failure, no NC or NNRTI resistance except for K103N, um, and no chronic hepatitis B. So, so this group here, you know, is is a purport a, a specific select proportion of people. I'm just going to point that out and highlight it because I think it's it's relevant and important to talk about. Um, and very similar to the previous studies, you know, so they took these suppressed, um, you know well-adherent folks and switch them to either con to, to either do or randomize them to either do an oral cab and repivering lead. And this was now only four weeks instead of the, the 16 or 24 weeks that we were seeing before. Um, and then follow that with the intramuscular cab and repivering or just continue on whatever three drug oral antiretroviral therapy that they were taking. And um, again, here they did a little bit better, I think, with their recruitment in the study. Uh, the, a slightly higher proportion of women um, in the study and a slightly higher proportion of uh, uh, Black Americans. Um, so again, we're seeing that <laughs> intramuscular cabotegravir and repivirine is as effective as three drugs oral art at 48 weeks. So it looked just as good in people that were switching. Um, and there were some virologic failures here. So again, we just saw three virologic failures uh, of everyone that failed. They all had some type of uh, RAM or resistance associated mutation at baseline. So this is, I think, really interesting lessons learned is that we really need to be careful about these baseline mutations when we are transitioning people to these regimens. And if the, there is any mutations, I think in any INSTE or NNRTI, um, those folks, we need to counsel them well and uh, follow them maybe a little bit more closely than not. Um, at virologic failure, you know, interestingly, you know, like only one of them accumulated another resistant mutation. So this guy just kept his, his L7 for one that he had before. Um, so possibly it's that combination of uh, RAMs in, in both arms that resulted or contributed to them failing. There are also four virologic failures in the oral arm, and uh, new RAMs are also detected in those persons. So, you know, it's not necessarily worse than continuing on oral therapy because you can also still fail your oral therapy with the development of resistance. Um, injection site reactions, again, really common. So 81%, a little bit less than the previous studies had shown. But interestingly, only four people of the 250 people that had any reaction, or actually 231 that had pain, only four of them actually stopped because of that. So 1% of, of participants in these studies discontinued using the injectables because of pain at the injectable site. Which, which is interesting, um, you know, that, that that was still the preference over taking pills every day. So Atlas 2M, um, Sorry for all these slides, if people are getting bored. You can ask me different questions. Uh, <laughs> these are all pretty similar, but I think it's important to kind of go over the nuances of, of these different studies. So 2M was very similar to ATLAS, except instead of comparing uh, the uh, injectable to an oral, it actually compared two different injectable schedules. So um, people were randomized to either getting the usual every four weeks as when, was demonstrated in ATLAS, or a higher dose of both medications every eight weeks. So this kind of pulls out the schedule a little bit more. <clears throat> Again, you know, like here's, here's the uh, uh, baseline characteristics. I'm not going to really go over that. Um, and these two regimens look, or they were basically the same. So they had very similar efficacy, um, whether you did the higher dose every eight weeks or the lower dose every four weeks. Um, and again, you know, so, so this, is, this is a little bit more difficult to, to interpret. Um, and if anybody wants to chime in, I'd love to also hear any comments if people have had further discussions with folks at Viva about this. So if you look at the Q8 weeks versus the Q4 weeks and the folks that, had, uh, that met a viral rebound um, evaluation, it looks like there were more people in the Q8 week arm that met that, uh, that viral rebound uh, indication, only two in the Q4 weeks. But if you looked at what their baseline resistance were, there were more people in the Q8 arm that had baseline resistance. So basically six out of eight compared to zero out of two, which is 
a similar proportion. Um, and they developed, you know, more resistance mutation over time because of the baseline. Um, so I, I don't know if this necessarily says, you know, like it's riskier, you're going to have a higher level of resistance. If you do the Q8 dosing versus the Q4 dosing, that's not how I interpret it. Um, does anyone else have any other thoughts or comments? Has anyone else been to or talked to anyone at Viva or have any other insight about, you know, four versus eight? Um, Miley, this is Luke. This is Lucas. Uh, I, uh, yeah, you know, Viva has done the analysis uh, looking at different factors associated with failure with the in, with this regimen, and that included people in the Q8 versus Q4 week arm and. Um, you know, being on Q8 versus Q4 was not predictive of failure when you adjusted for different factors. What was most predictive was having baseline ropivirine resistance. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, that I think in their opinion, this isn't a statistically significant difference either in this study, but um, it seems that probably what drives probably what the drives. failures more is, uh, is having baseline ropivirine resistance. You know, there were other factors and maybe you'll talk about it, but higher BMI. Um, and lower yeah. drug concentrations uh, also yeah. were correlated with with failure. Um, but again, uh, the the dosing scheme was not one that that was significant. Yeah, and I think um, I think it's important to talk about this as a group because there are are a lot of folks that are worried about Q8 weak dosing if it gets FDA approved, which I think most people believe it will. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, I think hopefully we can keep having these discussions and sharing our, our own, you know, post-marketing experiences with each other um, to really try to better understand, you know, who can we do this best in um, and who can we do this the safest. And if we need to think about different types of monitoring based on different individual factors. And okay. This is <laughs> Caparelli. At least on the adolescent side, there is some uh, close looking at body size. So. They are using in, in the planned, or at least the ongoing MOCA trial, they are using the adult dose down to, well, it's subdivided down to 50 and down to 35 kilos. So they're giving a bigger dose with the Q8, but they are moving forward with the Q8. Moving forward in the younger individuals, they're much more cautious and starting off with Q4, and they may or may not, depending on how results uh, roll out. And that's, it's, the study's actually 2036 that's, that's in development. Um, uh, how they're going to do that. And again, a lot of it has to do with uh, body size, the worrying about <coughs> altered absorption following IM injection. Thank you for sharing that. I don't have any information on adolescents because I do not care for that population. So I, I really appreciate the comments. Um, okay, so, you know, similar, I think we, we're seeing similar, you know, uh, site reactions and, and adverse effects. But again, um, the reaction leading to discontinuation is, is still pretty rare, rare. Only one to 2% of all participants decided to stop taking this regimen. Um, quick check. Okay, so um, in summary, you know, like CAB LA and Ripivirine, uh, or CAB and Ripivirine LA um, uh, was non inferior to oral therapy with dolutegravir, bacavir, lamivudine in maintaining HIV suppression. Injection sites were, react were very, very common. Um, in persons who were living with HIV who wanted to switch, monthly injections were non inferior to oral therapy. Um, and uh, dosing every eight weeks versus every four weeks with injections was also very similar in, in efficacy and safety profiles. So um, that is, is Cabalay and Ropivirine. I, I know I don't have that much more time. I kind of have more things to talk about. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to, I might skip some slides going forward. So what else, what else do we know about uh, uh, cabotegravir and ropivirine? So it's very interesting that many of the study participants in FLARE and LATI2 decided to continue uh, on their injectables after the study had met its endpoint and uh, the company continued to follow them over time. They found that, you know, in the two to five year period after the study had been completed, 97% of injections were given within this plus minus seven day window. So basically, you are allowed to give an injection within a 14 day window. So with your actual date in the middle, either seven days before or seven days after to allow some flexibility in, in dispensing. Um, a couple of participants used oral therapy when they to cover a planned misvisit. And when they did, they often used oral cabotegravir, cabotegravir and ropivirine to cover that visit. So they were on the same regimen that they've been taking intramuscularly. And um, for Atlas2M, 
the rate of confirmed viral failure overall is really, really low. So like 11 out of 1,000 people. Um, and really only one person met that criterion in that second year of therapy. So here are some of the observed uh, resistance-associated mutations when different people failed. And again, look, at, it's such a small percentage of people or a small number of people that have actually failed treatment. Um, 10 of the 11 of those folks that failed immediately or very quickly resuppress in a new regimen. The only one that did not was non-adherent to their protease inhibitor-based regimen, so that person you know, did not resuppress rapidly. And current guidelines, um, so based on the studies, you know, cabotegravir and ropivirine long-acting can be used for people with HIV who are taking oral antiretroviral therapy and are viral suppressed for greater than three months. Um, you cannot have any baseline resistance to either of those medications prior to the switch. Uh, no prior virologic failures. Um, you do not have active hepatitis B infection. You're not pregnant and you're not planning on becoming pregnant. And you're not receiving medications with a significant drug interaction. Um, it's absolutely important to assess tolerability using an oral lead-in for at least 28 days before the injection to kind of capture some of these kind of delayed hypersensitivity reactions that might show up. And the first injection should be given on the last day of oral therapy, not the day after. Um, continuation uh, therapy with monthly injections gives a 14-day a window plus minus seven days. And lots of, not lots of drugs, several drugs are actually contraindicated. Really, they're mostly the anticonvulsants and the rifamycin. So hopefully we're not switching people um, who also have tuberculosis. But a lot of us, you know, look at the provision of long-acting uh, medic HIV medications, and we're hoping that it was not going to only be for this like perfect population that takes their meds most of the time and are virologically suppressed and have no viral failures. I mean, we see this as like a great way to engage people that struggle with taking their pills every day, as we kind of talked about at, at the beginning of this talk. Um, but unfortunately, to date, we don't have evidence that uh, long-acting uh, ropivirine cabotegravir will work in folks that are struggling with meds. But, um, now let me just get these for a second here. We do have a study. <laughs> so the ACTG uh, 5359, or the Latitude Study, is evaluating this. So what they're doing is they, they want people who are not suppressed. They want people who are struggling to take their medications. These, these folks that we have ideally think that would do really, really well if they just could come in with like a monthly or a bi-monthly injection. Um, to help people get suppressed, so, so you know, just like the other studies, they want folks suppressed before they get switched to the injectables. They are incentivizing um, coming in and meeting metrics. So you complete a visit, you get $75. Um, you have a one log uh, drop in your HIV RNA, you get $75. So they're incentivizing people to take their meds up front so that we can get them to the place where they will either be um, uh, randomized to uh, to uh, uh, cabotegravir and long-acting rupivirine or continue on their standard of care. So this study has been difficult for us to recruit here at UCC. We are a site, and if any of you think that you might have someone that is interested, so I will say out front that we are also accepting people who use substances, but it kind of, whether or not they actually get accepted it depends on their degree of use. It's worth it, I think, to refer folks to us and let us kind of figure out, you know, do they qualify or not? Um, but, but this is a really important question that I, th that I think we as HIV physicians need to get answered. So please consider referring people to the study. Um, we've, we've had several people who just couldn't make it through this stage, but other people, you know, this worked really well for them and they were actually able to get themselves suppressed. Um, so just wanted to kind of highlight that before the end of the talk. Um, phone number, other phone things. number is in the chat, just yeah. FYI. Aurora put her phone number in there, so call. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just a couple of extra uh, other things to think about. You know, if it's been less than two months since your last injection, you can just resume your regular maintenance dose injections. If it's been greater than two months, you need to reinitiate. Um, and, and this is, is, of course, people that have, are taking something orally and are remaining suppressed but have kind of missed their shot. Um, other things, uh, so oral bridging, you know, if you know someone's going to be gone, so say somebody, I don't know, has to do sabbatical overseas and they don't think they're going to be able to get their, their injection, um, this is a, a good time to switch to oral. 
and continue, you know, whatever oral you want. But I think, you know, most people prefer to do the oral cabotegravir and ropivirine while they're bridging. And then, you know, when they return or if they want to resume taking their medications, then you would load them again and then continue the maintenance dose. Um, it's a little bit more difficult, you know, I think uh, if someone has an unplanned miss injection, so you couldn't orally bridge them. Um, and it's been more than a month and, and seven days or so. Um, if oral therapy was not taken, then you just really need to reassess and, and figure out like, where do we go from here? Do I need to resuppress somebody and then restart the injections? But, but you don't just give folks that have had, you know, this unplanned misinjection, uh, a maintenance injection again before you reassess them. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I did, my talk is titled, you know, like that we're, I did seem to suggest that we're entering a new era and some of you may be like, well, there's only one or two drugs available. Why do you think this is a new era? Because there's, there's more. <laughs> um, and I think I'm starting to run out of time. So I'm going to kind of brief, kind of skim over these. I'm sorry that I didn't have time to, to go over this in more detail. I'm going to just give you the highlights of these guys. So coming real soon, I hope, um, is cabotegravir for PrEP. Um, HPTN 083 study in men uh, and transgender uh, women has uh, been completed and actually demonstrated. Um, I, I, this study was great. I actually recruited a real nice proportion of uh, Black African Americans. Um, so this study has been completed and actually demonstrates superiority over FTDF. So cabotegravir for PrEP works better than FTDF for PrEP. Um, there. I think our ongoing discussions about whether or not it's more cost effective, um, there is, is data from Croy that suggests it's not more cost effective than either FTDF or FTAF, but it works better. So I, I think that this is going to be coming soon um, and we'll have more clinical guidelines on how best to use this very, very soon. Um, these are, uh, I'm gonna skip this, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna, just to kind of get through my slide set so I can talk about everything. But there were some, some in, uh, HIV infections in the cabotegravir arm. So there were 13 in the cabotegravir arm, 39 in the FTDF arm. Um, these guys occurred before, the infection occurred before they started. This guy, th these folks or this group of people kind of stopped and started and missed doses. Um, and then these were kind of, a, uh, you know, like there was a, around the time of, of the infection. And then oops, the, this last grouping is probably, these developed while they likely had uh, appropriate levels of cabotegravir. Um, so there, there are still some incident HIV infections. Um, and then the LIFE study, or HPTN 084, um, was done only for women, and it was uh, performed in sub-Saharan Africa, and also demonstrated superiority. Cabotegravir long-acting was superior over FTDF for HIV PrEP. Um, they had a total of 38 HIV infections in 3,223 cis women. Um, four of them were in the cattle arm, 34 were in the FTC-TDF arm. Um, nine times more incident HIV infections occurred in the FTC-TDF arm, which translates into an 89% lower risk of HIV infection with cabotegravir. Um, so, so this is really remarkable. Um, I will say that there were, I think there were about 50 pregnancies in this study, and um, so far, uh, in the, a handful of um, of fetal deaths and malformations. So far, they do not seem to see a signal with cabotegravir with uh, fetal malformations or fetal death, but there is still a bunch of missing information as to the, the etiology and cause and timeline. So I think that we still can't say yet whether or not um, cabotegravir is 100% safe for women who become pregnant. But, um, I also want to talk about some of the drugs that are coming. So it's not just uh, ibilizumab and cabotegravir and long-acting ropivirine. Lenacaprevir is a really exciting uh, medication. It's a first in class. Um, it is a capsid inhibitor. And because you need to actually have a capsid at multiple stages of the HIV life cycle, it works at multiple stages of the HIV life cycle. So it's incredibly potent. It works um, upon uh, Following entry, when the capsid is getting disassembled, it, it kind of blocks that and prevents entry and integration, subsequent integration. Um, when HIV is being generated or, or recreated, it prevents its uh, formation of virions that are uh, infected, infectious because, again, it blocks the capsid, um, as well, uh, ultimately, like it blocks capsid assembly. So 
multiple levels, first in class, really potent, um, and currently being evaluated uh, for. Um, uh, oh, th this is a study, I'm sorry. So this is a, a functional monotherapy study. So this, this is a study in highly treatment experienced persons. They did a 14-day functional monotherapy with, le with lenocaprevir oral. Um, how they did this is they continued people on a failing regimen, um, added oral lenocaprevir to see, you know, like, does that alone have an effect? And, and it did indeed show everybody had a decline um, who were participating in this oral lenocaprevir arm. And then they switched them over to optimized uh, regimen for maintenance. Um, overall, you know, like, I think this, this looks pretty good for highly treatment experience. I don't know what their plans are in moving this forward in that population, but I think that, that this is, is a group um, that is, uh, is interesting to look at. Um, injectable, or uh, let me look at my notes, okay. Injectable lenocaprevir uh, has the PA to be given every six months. So it's incredibly potent and it's currently formed. It seems that we can give subcutane subcutaneous lenocaprevir every six months, which makes it kind of perfect for PrEP. So there is going to be at UCSD a lenocaprevir PrEP study, um, which Dr. Joe Blumenthal is, is leading. Um, I don't, do you know when this is starting, Jill? When are you guys gonna be open? Um, the study is starting June, June 2021, but I, I don't think we'll be the first Sites okay. you know, there's there are hundreds of sites um, in the United States and outside, but we'll call it the summer. But this okay. summer, so the, this is a double dummy design. You know, people will either be randomized two to one to lenocaprevir sub Q every six months plus FTDF uh, placebo, um, or FTDF uh, daily plus a every six months lenocaprevir placebo, and they're also going to be evaluating, um, just doing a cross-sectional HIV incidence cohort of people that are not enrolled in the study to get a better idea of, of the incidence over time in this period. Um, Dr. Blumenthal, uh, again, will be running the study. This is very exciting. Um, it's going to be focused on men of sexist men um, and transgender women, and uh, as well as, uh, do you, not, is it women too or just this yeah, study okay. is, is uh, cisgender, MSM, uh, and then transgender women, transgender men, non-binary individuals. Cisgender women are not in this study. There is a separate study for cisgender women, but the sites um, right now are only in Africa. I don't know if that will change at some point. Um, we certainly would make a push to try to have it here uh, if it were available, but this is what it says at the top, cis MSM, transgender women, transgender men, gen gender non-binary individuals with a really high focus on um, racial and ethnic minorities. And then um, I wanna kind of end us. So I'll just mention again, I'm sorry, I can't go over these in detail, but there are a couple other medications that are out there. So is Latrevir is our first nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor also works at uh, multiple points in, in the HIV life cycle. Um, this is being evaluated in an implant form, potentially for PrEP, um, which will also be very, very exciting to have. Um, MK8507, an another novel potent NNRTI, it looks like we can give this orally weekly as an incredibly long half-life. And together, uh, Eslatrovir and MK8507 are being evaluated for efficacy in a, a oral once weekly phase 2B study. So we've got both long-acting injectables and potentially long-acting orals coming down the pipeline. And that is really exciting because it gives our folks options if they don't want to get shot. So I'm, I'm very, very excited about what could be possible in the new era. Um, I think as many as you, of you know, as HIV doctors, we often focus on HIV primacy, which tends to involve a lot of assessment and, and uh, involvement in addressing barriers to engagement, suppression, um, and adherence. And if we have these long-acting medications where you know they're tolerated well, our patients like to take them, um, we don't have to worry so much about you know ensuring adherence and viral suppression because of these medicines. 
it gives us the opportunity to really focus on a lot of other things. And this, I think, is where my interest really comes in. <laughs> so, you know, we can improve our management and think more about these non-HIV comorbidities. We can really start to think about how do we better address health inequities in, in, for our folks, um, as well as uh, spend a lot more time on managing and addressing novel issues that are related to aging with HIV. So it doesn't just have to be HIV primacy anymore if we don't have to worry about suppression. Um, I think that the long actings may also positively impact HIV stigma. Um, again, that's not been studied yet. I'm hoping that we will have more information on that going forward. I know that's of interest. Um, I also hope and, and expect that you know, long actings may enhance the quality of life for people living with HIV. And my, I mean, I think, I think for all of us, I'd love it if, you know, the introduction of long-acting oral and injectable HIV medications could uh, totally lead to ending the HIV epidemic. I think that's the goal. I think there's promise there. Of course, you know, with any new um, medications, everything looks shiny up front. And then, you know, post-marketing, we see stuff is not quite as great as we thought it was going to be. But it's, it's incredibly hopeful that, that, you know, HIV care is moving in this direction. Um, okay, I'm, uh, I'm not going to do the, the last few slides are uh, just like practical information about the provision of uh, cabotegravir and LA Repivirine. Um, I think the slides will be available somewhere if people want to look at that anyway. So, or if you want them, just email me and I can, I can send them to you as well, if you want that information. Any questions? I think we also may have, and I'm putting him on the spot, we'll probably have Lucas talk at some point once uh, the program at Owen and other places have rolled out to talk about some of those logistics and, and practicalities of Cabanuva. Um, there are a few questions, Miley. First of all, thank you. That was great. Um, you know, an amazing summary of what's going on in the long acting field and really an exciting one. Um, Robert Dice asks if you can talk again about the inclusion criteria or ideal patients for 85359. Yeah, so so we don't want people that have had a, have a history of cabotag or um, basically insti resistance or rapivirine. So I think that that would be the major barrier for a lot of folks that you might be thinking about. But we want folks that are struggling with adherence. We want people that have detectable viremia. Um, and you again, you know, you can have um, both a you know impactful mental health and substance use disorder, but we do have screening levels that um, well. At a certain level, if you're severely depressed or you are um, have a severe substance use disorder, you you may not qualify for the study. But refer people to us, and we can do that work, and we can figure that out. Um, Edie says from her conversations with VVREPS uh, that oral cabinuva will not be available in pharmacies for bridging. I think that was a comment that was made. And that doesn't make sense, but huh? Okay, that's interesting. That's well. Then I guess we'll have to bridge with something else. Yeah, uh, it, 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 it's, it's not commercially available in pharmacies. Oral, oral cabotegravir is uh, restricted to a single mail order uh, pharmacy that serves the whole country. So um, it's not easily accessible. So the bridges are going to end up probably having to be with other oral ART. Um, Jeff Taylor asks, how will people on Cabanuva prep stop, safely stop? Just a comment there, it's not Cabanuva prep, it's Cabotegravir prep. Cabanuva is the combination of Cabotegravir and Ropivirine. So just Cabotegravir prep. Um, presumably they'll choose ca um, Cabotegravir because they don't want to take pills. So it's unlikely they'll do oral prep for months to cover the tail. That's a whole huge, I know Miley, if you wanna talk about it, it's nine o'clock. We could talk about this for another 20 minutes. Um, I mean, these, these, these are discussions that, you know, are gonna be had in the, when people are signing up for the clinical study, you know, cause that, that is very worrisome, I agree. Yeah, and, and I think uh, you're saying that presumably people don't want to take pills. I've there have been you know studies that have looked at this. My offhand, offhanded conversations with patients. Some want to do pills because you know coming in for injections is not going to be what they want to do, and it's just easier for them to take pills. So um, I think we've talked about that the theme at Croy around prevention and treatment was choice. And I think that's what we want to see for patients. Um, obviously, the tail is, is sort of a separate issue, but that will obviously have to be discussed with patients regardless of what that looks like. Um, 
That was it. Well, I think a lot of people asked questions as we went. I sorry if I if I missed anything from anyone. Uh, it is after nine though. I realize pe people have patience and and meetings to get to. Um, Miley, thank you so much for this really uh, engaging um, talk and and really gives us a lot to think about moving forward. So thank you. Thanks, Miley. Have a good day, everybody.